Now let's talk about the greatest threat to the Ghost Division, the 7th Panzer Division, during the Battle of France. Now I already made a video on why the 7th Panzer Division earned the name Ghost Division, be sure to check it out on my main channel. And we're talking mainly about here the British counterattack at Arras. And it's quite interesting because there are various misconceptions here. For instance, it's called a tank battle. Whereas Karl Heinz Frieser points out, well, actually, this doesn't really add up, but more about this later. So, what went on? Basically, the prelude is that Rommel attacks again, but only with his Panzer Regiment, and he leaves behind his two motorized infantry regiments. The 5th Panzer Division should cover his flank, but it can't. Rommel still moves forward. Meanwhile, the British conduct a counterattack. And basically, they show up at the perfect time, at the perfect place. Ironically, they don't conduct recon, so this happens mostly by a surprise. Now, Rommel at one point, when he's wide forward, he notes that his infantry is not coming up. So he moves back to, to look what is going on with the infantry. And what happens, he basically arrives during the attack. So he sees around 40 tanks attacking his infantry. He reacts immediately, he moves to a position, a certain height where anti-tank guns were already in place and he commands them. Now at first, the German anti-tank guns, the Park have no problems to shoot up the British tanks, mostly A11, the Matilda 1 tanks. Yet suddenly there are bigger tanks there which don't really react to the German anti-tank fire. These are the Matilda 2s, the A12s. So the Germans hit them and not very much happens. To quote directly from a report here, against the heavy tanks of the English, their own anti-tank guns are not effective, even at close distances. The defensive fronts formed by them are broken through by the enemy, the guns are shot down or run over. Most of the crews are slaughtered. Now how do the Germans finally stop the Matildas there with the help of an artillery battery that's nearby. Yet, although their units don't break into panic or anything, the na a neighboring division has this problem that some run away in panic. Now, the other Schützen Regiment is also attacked, Rommel is not close by, and there's an anti tank battalion that tries to stop the tanks and is basically rolled over. Now, a very interesting aspect here is that Rommel was leading from the front and he was likely one of the most extreme examples who did this. So he did it more than most other generals. This had several results. First off, likely this prevented some of the units from getting into panic because they see their general there and, and he's holding the line. So yeah, it's not good to run. And what they did, they let break through some of the British tanks and let move them past. And then they shot at the following infantry. Of course, this was only possible because the British attack had a bad coordination between infantry and the tanks. And how dangerous the situation actually got, um, his orderly was killed in action on this day and a few days beforehand his adjutant was wounded in action. And you need to put this in perspective, some will point out, oh he's really brave. The point is, he is the commander of a division of about 11 to 13,000 men. He should him put himself not that much into harm's way because he gets killed. This will also affect the ongoing operations and the whole division and everything. So it's always, of course, it's war. So there's always a balance between bravery and to a certain degree also responsibility on another level. Now, what did Rommel ultimately do to stop this attack and contain it? Frieser points out four points. First, he formed a line of anti-tank guns and also anti-aircraft guns, light anti-aircraft guns. Now, these weapons were not effective against the Matilda tanks, the Matilda 2 A12s, but all these smaller, lighter tanks of the British were shot up. So the Matildas were basically left alone. Now, additionally, the second point is he created a second line of heavy anti aircraft artillery of Flak 88 and also a regular artillery. These could deal with the Matildas rather well. Additionally, the Luftwaffe came in, although this was already in the evening when the attack was fought back. 
and he also called back his Panzer Regiment. The issue is, the German tanks arrived mostly when the British were already gone and retreated to their original position. This is why Friese points out this was actually not really a tank battle. Yet, the losses were quite extensive. The Panzer Division suffered more losses than in total of the first four days together. Now, this was mostly the German view. So, what is the view for the British and the French? So, the British and French actually had similar plans. And Churchill pointed out there was basically this turtle, the German lines, and its head, basically the panzer spearheads in the motorized division, was sticking out further and further, and you need to cut it off because then it was not protected. So, the head was outside of the armor. Now, the major problem is the Allies had a rather lackluster initiative. And mostly the British did act, the French did not. So, at one point, General Ironside, British commander, got really angry and he grabbed General Bichot by uh, here. And yeah, he was like, okay, I lost my temper because he was so angry. And very important here, this was General Bichot, not confused with the be shot who at stone shot up several German panzers. I covered in another video, which gives you, I think, the be shot medal in Wall of Tanks is named after him. So I'm not sure how, how the achievement is called, but it's named after him. And there was actually now a communication problem between the British and the French again. The order was to attack on the 21st of May, and the French reformulated that from the 21st onward. As such, the British basically attacked for the most part alone. There later came some, but yeah, it was not really well organized. So what did the British do? They organized two tank battalions and each was supported by a light infantry regiment. In total, they had 88 tanks. 58 of them were the Matilda 1, the A11s. 16 were the A12 Matilda 2s, which were the formidable tanks. And they were around 14 light tanks, I don't know which type. Whereas the French 3rd Mechanized brought Samoa uh, tanks and protected flanks. For the S-35 Samoa, check out this video. They also brought additional units. They brought an artillery battery, a heavy anti-tank battery, an anti-tank platoon, and recon units. Now, there were various issues with this attack. So, there were basically two groups, as mentioned before. The first one lost orientation and attacked in the wrong direction. There was a big back and forth and finally arrived. The second group actually hit the Schützen Regiment and broke through the anti-tank guns, yet then ran into a line of artillery and heavy AA guns, where most of them were lost. Now, only a few tanks actually broke through. Now, about the coordination with the French, initially they attacked the British, but when the British were finally retreating, they covered the flanks and prevented the German panzers from cutting them off. In total of the 88 tanks the British used during the attack, only 28 returned. And at the end of the day, they had the same position as they started out. So there was no change in territory. It was not combined arms warfare. There was little infantry, less artillery and no air support as one offer pointed out. Yet, as minor the effectiveness was to a certain degree, it had also a major impact. Because it led to the halt order Hitler gave, basically, which allowed the British and also the French to a certain degree to evacuate at Dunkirk. Now, I did already a video on the halt order because there was, there was basically a struggle going on on the German side. They were basically the, the people, we need to keep our flanks protected. The, the old guard and the new guard like Guderian and Rommel was like, just move forward. The longer the flanks, the better. We don't care. The, the French and British are too sluggish anyway. We must move fast and we will win. So ultimately Hitler intervened here and the Battle of Arras is seen as one of or the incident that sparked this and basically led to the hard order. Yet on the other side, we must add the British and French were unable to exploit this attack at all. 
because if it was had been a concentrated attack, they could have cut off the German units and conduct encirclement themselves or pre or reunite with the troops in France and everything and so that they are not stuck in Belgium. Now big thank you here to Nick who basically initiated this video because he asked originally which was the best British tank for 1940. He also asked us for the French for which I did another video and for the British I looked at this and I said well I don't want to do another comparison to a Panzer and also the, the result for me was rather obvious because there were very few tanks active in the Battle of France and basically it was the A11 Matilda, Matilda 1, the A12 Matilda, some Matilda 2, sometimes Matilda Senior, there's, there's a kind of weird going on with the naming scheme here, and the A13 Cruiser. Now the Cruiser was not well, well armed and there were various issues. The Matilda had, was, in my opinion, was the best British tank at this point. Problem is it was rather slow and it was underarmed as well, but it could take a lot of punishment, also the free man tore it and various other aspects in which part it was quite modern, but it was an infantry tank, not really fast, but the E13 had made many troubles and the A11 was already seriously outdated. So anyway, thank you here to Nick for the question. Big thank you here to Michael for sending me the British tank books and to Jack for sending me Blitzkrieg Legend. Thank you very much and see you next time.